right. Good evening. I'm Lisa Carrico, Program Director for the Missouri Humanities. We are a member-supported organization, and our mission is dedicated to enriching lives and strengthening communities by connecting Missourians with the people, places, and ideas that shape our society. Thank you for joining our virtual reading and roundtable in celebration of the release of Proud to Be, Writing by American Warriors, Volume 11. Since 2011, we have partnered with organizations across the state to provide veterans, military personnel, and their families with an outlet for self-expression through writing. Our veteran programs include writing workshops, a Proud to Be podcast, and this annual publication and reading. Together, these programs encourage hundreds of veterans each year to tell their stories. Volume 11 features 37 contributors from all over the nation who have graciously shared their military-related stories in the form of essays, fiction, poetry, and photography. The stories within provide readers with an intimate insight into the lives and personal experience of those who have served and memorialize representation of the unique aspects of military service in our nation's history. Tonight, we'll hear from six contributors who will share some of their original writings, followed by a roundtable discussion featuring four additional contributors and moderated by New York Times bestselling author Mark Bowden. We are extremely thrilled Bowden will be joining us. Proud to be is a juried competition, and Bowden served as a judge in our inaugural volume. Part of tonight's discussion will reverberate this year's foreword, written by Virginia Brackett, an author, educator, and member of the Kansas City Veterans Writing Team, which invites readers to consider how to read a true war story. Please be aware that at times this reading may contain strong language and is intended for mature audiences. We invite you to be part of the conversation. Be, feel free to rally the readers in the chat box and submit your questions through the Q&A feature. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible towards the end of the program. Please be mindful of your questions and comments as we'd like to create a thoughtful dialogue and a safe space. If you'd like to learn more about Missouri Humanities, please check us out on social media at Mo Humanities. We invite you to learn more about our upcoming events as well as our membership program where benefits include free books, discounted tickets to special programs, and access to member-only events. Joining's easy. Visit mohumanities.org and click become a member. I'd like to thank the many people who have made this volume possible, from the book contributors to the judges and to those who are tuning in. A special thanks to our editor, Dr. James Brubaker at Southeast Missouri State University Press, who will be introducing tonight's readers and panelists. Before turning this over to James, I'd like to share a video with a few opening remarks from our state's Lieutenant Governor, Mike Kehoe. Hello, I'm Lieutenant Governor Mike Kehoe. Welcome to the Proud to Be Virtual Reading and Roundtable. I would like to thank the Missouri Humanities and Southeast Missouri State University Press for their work to publish the 11th volume of this Veterans Writing Competition. Collecting and sharing stories from veterans, military personnel, and their family not only helps to preserve history, but also sheds light on the important role these individuals play and have played in our country. These personal stories of the dedicated and brave individuals who wore our country's uniform serve as a tool to build understanding, empathy, and connection. The Proud to Be Writing by American Warriors anthology series does just this. It provides a platform for our nation's military members to creatively share their stories in their own words and invites readers to experience the many facets of military life. From deployment, to service, to transitioning from service and war, to readjusting to the complexities of daily life. As Lieutenant Governor, I serve as the official veterans advocate and I am proud to know that our state is doing its part to preserve and share these stories. We are proud that over 450,000 veterans call Missouri home and we will always honor their service and commitment to our country. In 2020, we established the Veterans Hall of Fame at the Missouri State Capitol as another way to honor the experiences and stories of our state's heroes. From hero hunts at our Missouri State Parks to honor flights taking off across the states, Missourians appreciate the service of our veterans. 
and the Proud to Be series has provided hundreds of veterans, military personnel, and their family members from across the nation, spanning generations, a necessary conduit to share their stories through writing and photography that may not have otherwise been shared. Now in its 11th volume, Proud to Be is a testament to the commitment of the Missouri Humanities to share these insightful works. Thank you to Mark Bowden for joining in this virtual reading and roundtable. Your perspective in history and military-based writing will surely bring an engaging discussion with the veteran writers. We are committed to making Missouri the most veteran-friendly state in the nation. Thank you and God bless each and every one of you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. James Brubaker, Director of Southeast Missouri State University Press. Uh, it's my profound pleasure and privilege to continue to be involved with Proud to Be and these events. Huge thanks to Lisa and Missouri Humanities for all they do for us, also to my university uh, and English department for all the support they give. Um, <clears throat> so I'll be introducing our readers tonight. First up, we have David P. Irvin. Uh, David P. Irvin is an infantry veteran of the Iraq War who went on to obtain a BA in history from West Virginia University. He has written and published a memoir of his time in war, as well as numerous short pieces of nonfiction and fiction. Let's have a big virtual round of applause for David P. Irvin. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, this is called A Dark Smudge. Sergeant Grant Morrison stood in a column of desert camouflage on the tarmac. At the end of the line of waiting men, a United Airlines 747, humpbacked and massive, loomed. There was a dull brown haze on the horizon. It was not clouds or smog, but was the Kuwaiti desert itself in early winter. Morrison sidestepped to look past the men of his battalion. He saw the closed door of the aircraft and wondered what was taking so long. The moments now are interminable. All the moments during the past two weeks spent on flights and bus rides and transient tents on dusty bases. Navigating the logistical machinery had been endless too. There had been a few minutes of chattering and laughter when the men first marched out onto the tarmac and had seen the plane that would take them home, but it had died down long ago. Now there was only the piercing whine of idling jet engines and more waiting. After a while, a staircase rolled up to the plane door. Soldiers in the Army's new blue-gray uniforms piled out of the aircraft and down the steps in one long, undulating line. Look at that, said Morrison. Private Pasquale half-turned but did not answer him. Morrison shrugged to adjust his slung rifle. That it was really over, the year of heat and patrols and raids and bodies, was not the overwhelming feeling he expected. He was only tired. He remembered stepping off the plane a year ago, everything so new to him. They had passed the long line of National Guardsmen in faded uniforms who had tired, hollow eyes, almost to a man. He told Sergeant Batista that it felt like some scene from a movie, and he expected him to say to welcome to hell or something like that. Batista had said he thought it was melodramatic, he told him they were just exhausted, and he was right. He had been in the invasion and had been through all this once before. Batista had been right about many things, it turned out, even the things he could not explain well. But Batista was gone now, had been for months. Morris had not even seen his body. He peeked over Pasquale's shoulder at the approaching soldiers. They looked pale and had new haircuts. Their uniforms were rumpled but new. Many had the slack look of interrupted sleep. Others had wide, darting eyes. Some of them looked very young. His line shifted forward, and Morrison stared at his boots after he took a step. The tan swayed and grayed and hardened after many soakings in sweat and in the mud and canals in, of the valley of the Euphrates. There were many stains, some from oil and grease of the battered Humvees and others from the swill of the village alleys. The dark smudge on the toe of his left boot was from an altogether different source. It was several months ago and his squad had just returned to their patrol base by the Euphrates. He was outside smoking when he saw a wet smear on his boot. It was dulled by the dust, but he knew what it could be. They had just spent the day policing up what was left of four Charlie Company guys after they'd driven their Humvee over an IED. There were only wet pieces in the dust. He had stared at that greasy splotch on his boot for a long time and smoked and brooded while he figured out what to do. He settled on walking over to the corner by the latrines and rubbing the toe of his boot into the dirt until he couldn't see the smudge anymore, but it always came back. 
sometimes it reminded him of how glad he was that he had not been in there when his company had had to do the same for all the pieces of Batista. It was an awful thought to have, and he returned to it often. Maybe Batista would have said it was melodramatic too, but casualties weren't something he talked about much. It was one of the things he admitted to Morrison that he could not explain well because it was too big and too awful to give words to. Sorry, Morrison, said Britton behind him. Morrison turned around, startled, and saw Britton's wide shaved head nodding toward the plane. The line had shuffled forward and Morrison caught up to Pasquale with a couple of long strides. The line of new soldiers passed them now. A captain led the way, a stout man with a round face. The rifle he carried in one hand was jet, jet black, clean, and free of the moon dust that would soon accumulate in its crevices. Good game, y'all. Good game, said Britton behind him. There was a ripple of chuckling. Morrison turned around. Most of the men behind him were regarding the new soldiers with the kind of muted expression seen on the faces of distant relations at a funeral. Turning back to the plane, Morrison made made eye contact with the young second lieutenant. His angular face was bluish from stubble. The officer looked at him with a sort of furrowed brow and anxious grimace, like he was looking for something or waiting to hear something very important. Morrison thought about saying welcome to hell when he passed by. The thing Batista had said was melodramatic, but he was not there to say it again. There was not really anything to say anyway. The lieutenant would figure it out, all the things that could not be put into words by anyone. They exchanged nods when he passed, and Morrison wondered if the young officer would make it through the air. Maybe he would. Maybe the men behind him would not. Morrison looked down in his boots and again noticed the dark stain that he would carry on with him. Thank you so much, David. <clears throat> Our next reader will be Jay Harden. Uh, Jay Harden is a graduate of the University of Georgia and St. Louis University. He completed 63 combat missions in a B-52 during the Vietnam War, then became a Defense Department physical scientist working to create the first digital mapping system in the world. He also served 10 years in the Missouri Air National Guard. In 1970, he published a book, Spirit on Fire, A Story of Love, Art, and Healing, that is available on Amazon and Lulu. Let's have a big virtual round of applause for Jay Harden. Thank you. I'm reading a short poem from volume 11. I'll say their names. I do not deserve this. This is not mine. The honor in war goes to the dead. It is right that their letters instead of ours be carved and sewn in sacred places. We were their witnesses. We saw what they did and speak for them about their deeds. Above all, we say their names. We go on with the mission, now our duty, while they until we join them. Thank you so much, Jay. Our next reader is Charles Jacobson. Charles Jacobson is an army vet with an abiding interest in philosophy and the arts and a cat who doesn't like him. He is published and proud to be pure slush books, Fleas on the Dog, Military Experience and the Arts, Poet's Choice, Drunk Monkeys, Wingless Dreamer, The Yard and Callisto Gaia Press. Let's have a big virtual round of applause for Charles Jacobson. This uh, excerpt concerns Charlie Company, a unit of 100 men operating in Tainan province in Vietnam during uh, 1970. Tainan is 50 to 60 kilometers northwest of Saigon. They had set out an ambush on a path next to their encampment and uh, woke up when it went off in the early morning hours. We joined Charlie Company after a squad was sent out to assess the situation. One man had been shot in the head. The medic was already treating the wounded man and talking to Benoit, 
Upsetting? Absolutely. A gap in a squad is hard. Soldiers are not interchangeable. Captain Jackson wanted no more surprises. One seriously injured man was enough. A tank platoon was around the corner, so he ordered up a big boy. If you could come by, if you could swing by, it would be greatly appreciated. Before long, the faint sound of a diesel in the distance, louder, the ground began to shake. A dull, angry roar, accompanied by the sound of falling timber, echoed through the jungle. Out of the woods came a monster from the deep, clanking to a noisy stop on our doorstep. We gazed up at the patent battle tank, dumbstruck by 99,000 pounds of blast furnace steel in the middle of the jungle. A man popped out of the beast, shouting over the idling engine. You rang? We pointed and asked for a bit of caution. Don't run over JR's squad. They're still out there. A spoonful of Patton was just what the doctor ordered. And for the plat de jour, the commander selected Beehive 90 millimeter canister to end the Mexican standoff with the two enemy stragglers. A beehive round breaks apart when leaving the gun barrel, propelling 5,600 flechettes, nails with fins, in a dispersal cone like a load of shot you've never seen. Its mellifluous name comes from the soothing sound the arrows make flying through the air, extenerating anything in its way with startling ease. Range? 1,200 feet. Flechettes were first used in Vietnam by landing zone bird, which had been overrun and taken numerous casualties. The officer in charge ordered the last artillery piece to load beehive ammo and aim at ground level. He took out 200 NVA with a couple rounds, saved the day. After that, the popularity of flechettes soared and reports of enemy soldiers nailed to trees began appearing in the press. Gunner, beehive, woods. Identified, up. Driver, move out. Gunner, take over. The armored knight shifted into gear and slowly ambled away, bashing trees and crushing dead bodies with heavy treads. Driver, stop. Power. The tank bowed and turned its turret before lowering its gun barrel. Fire. On the way. Swoosh. We had just been insured by the U.S. 11th Cav. Funeral arrangements still pending. Target. Cease fire. Driver. Back up and the queer mechanical beast went on its way. We waited for the medevac before tracking the tank to its den. A strange comfort greeted us upon our arrival. Four patents and their armored and their associated armored personnel carriers had encircled a Sheridan light tank like elephants with their young. Earlier in the day, the Sheridan lost a wheel to a pressure mine. A soldier riding on the rear with his legs dangling down lost those too. While a repair crew worked on the disabled tank and the radio kept us updated on our injured comrade, we partied to transistor radios, built bonfires, and pulled guard. Bob and I sacked out in the Sheraton for the hell of it. No need for a security perm perimeter or entrenchments. Who would be fool enough to bring the massive firepower of our combined arsenals down on their heads? To prove it, a tank riddled the wood line with flechettes, cutting down a cloud of trees with a big whoosh. In the morning, the tankers went their way, we went ours, the jungle opening and closing behind us, leaving no trace. During the day, news reached us that our 11 kills set a new record 
or the division or an ambush and that the injured man hadn't made it a blow to our hearts. No one spoke. Who will know our grief? Thank you. Thanks so much, Charles. Our next reader is Jill Michelle. Jill Michelle was born to a second generation submariner. Her grandfather, Captain Kenneth G. Curtis, served during World War II. Her brother, Richard L. Curtis, worked his way from E1 to Lieutenant Commander during his 25 years of naval service. Recent poems appear in DMQ Review, Untethered Magazine, Please See Me, The Elevation Review, and Drunk Monkeys. Recent anthology credits include The Book of Bad Bettys and Words from the Brink. Let's have a big virtual round of applause for Jill and Michelle. Thank you. This poem is inspired by the Sarman and Garfunkel song, Slip Sliding Away and it's called Headed Home Again. Submarine, scene of fear's first memory. Blue uniform dad leans over the open hatch, smiles, passes toddler me downward into some strange sailor's arms. A throat knot steals my scream. Panic shoots through preschool limbs too soon without him. Fingers stretching for his face in the circle of sky above. The shock of being let go does not wear off. It's 30 odd years into the future, three into Alzheimer's lost ocean of thoughts. We spend Fridays together, dining out and talking to folks, two of his last pleasures. At the cafe, I watch him offer handshakes to the baseball capped veterans, wave at nearby kids peeking over booth tops, order his usual, scrambled eggs and bacon, wheat toast, a chocolate muffin wrapped to go, pointing at an upside down menu, pretending to read the words. The knot returns, wedges in my throat. I sense the hole opening up below our checkered table and feel his mind letting go, dementia rushing me into the arms of the years ahead, close to a decade now of searching skyward for him. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jill. Our next reader is Jacob Riesinger. Jacob Riesinger is the first or is a first year poet in the Syracuse University MFA program. He is currently working on a project that involves curating and analyzing poetry derived from World War II. He has served in the military since 2013 with both active duty Army and Air Force National Guard. His work has appeared in Rust and Glass and the Albion Review. Let's have a big virtual round of applause for Jacob Riesinger. Thank you so much. Um, First and foremost, um, I want to give everybody a moment. Um, there is an allusion to suicide, so if that is, I just feel like everyone deserves a trigger warning before starting. Um, this poem is called My Combat. My first deployment to Germany were shackles and chains linked to a countdown app, 956 days. The National Training Center where I didn't shower for 17 days. Married people shipped back to Fort Hood so the army could avoid paying family separation. Me and Bolger joking uh, every other day about doing a tandem cement swan dive from the third story of our barracks. Nine months on the DMZ abstracted by Trump tweeting at Rocket Man. My military commander preaching, you're a speed bump if we're invaded. Expiration of terminal service, ETS day, hugging Bolger saying, well, I guess this is it. The local VA hospital telling me my suicide attempt only warranted monthly group sessions because I'm not broken enough. VA doctors questioning me why my spine feels like coiled molten steel, interior, interior, interrogating me like I stole money from their golf funds. The Ann Arbor VA hospital, I sit mannequin still, my puppy shame guarding bottled piss concealed behind my leg, someone screaming, I can't live like this. A call from Bolger's girlfriend while tailgating because he cries hysterically at night. I sneak off during halftime to cry in the stadium stall. The sour word combat still sits on my tongue after every response to a stranger thanking me for my service. 
Thanks so much, Jacob. Our next reader is Adam Strauss. Adam Strauss is a Marine veteran. His work has appeared or is forthcoming in the Iowa Review, the South Dakota Review, Pithead Chapel, Line of Advance, Wrathbearing Tree, and elsewhere. Adam is currently a second year MFA candidate at Rutgers Camden. Let's have a big virtual round of applause for Adam Strauss. I just wanted to thank Luke Rawls for choosing my short story, Crisis and Response, as a winner of this year's Fiction Award. Um, I'll be reading an excerpt from the beginning of that piece. For the first half of deployment, my platoon sat in Kuwait and did absolutely fucking nothing. We were part of a regional crisis response force, but it was 2019 and there were no crises to respond to. During our days on alert, we maintained an N plus six tether, meaning we had to be ready to fly anywhere in the Middle East within six hours. Like most things in the Marine Corps, that sounded pretty cool. In reality, we recounted and recounted the same loadout of weapons and ammunition, read and reread the same intel reports, and rehearsed and rehashed the same immediate action drills we'd use if anyone ever shot at us. That was it. When my platoon wasn't on alert, the guys would compete to see who could sleep the most in a 24 hour period. One day, a machine gunner attached to second squad claimed to have slept straight from 7 p.m. to 11.30 a.m. and then napped from 2 p.m. until 5 p.m. after chugging a whole bottle of NyQuil. Everyone thought he was lying, but it's tough to tell whether someone's actually sleeping or just pretending. Staff Sergeant Shaughnessy, my platoon sergeant, who tended to be the last word on everything in the platoon, said it would almost be more impressive if he'd stayed awake in bed with his eyes closed for 19 and a half hours. So the machine gunner claimed the title. Between our Quonset hut sputtering air conditioner and the ambient snoring, talking, listening to music and masturbating, I could never sleep much during our off weeks. I laid on my battered cot, listening to sandstorms howl across the desert, feeling the stained fabric stick to my sweaty back, grappling with the reality that this was the thing for which I'd been working my whole adult life, trying to make peace with the fact that I was going to spend my entire time overseas waiting for nothing, imagining what it would be like to return home with no stories to tell and no ribbons to wear. I'm doing everything that's asked of me. I'm doing everything that's asked of me. I repeat that mantra until I fell asleep or the sun rose again, whichever came first. Staff Sergeant Shaughnessy slept soundly in the cot next to mine, content with the things he'd already done. Shaughnessy was the only one of my Marines with any combat experience. 10 years earlier, he'd patrolled the streets of Ramadi, a Sunni city an hour west of Baghdad. As he loved to remind everyone, his was one of the last real deployments to Iraq. Shaughnessy told the same story over and over again about how he'd unzipped a guy with a burst from a 50 cal. He had a picture on his phone that he liked to show off of him posing with the corpse, kneeling next to what was left of the man he'd killed. The insurgent had been reduced to two legs, one arm, and a red smear on the pavement. As an officer, I was probably supposed to say something about the fact that he had the picture and the fact that he waved it around like that. I never did. And I seriously longed to take a picture of my own, though I told myself I wouldn't show it off the way Shaughnessy did. Maybe just once or twice at my next unit, so the guys there would know I had it. And maybe just once or twice in a bar, if someone ever doubted who I was. We lived like this for three months. Then, around mid-July, massive anti-government protests began roiling Baghdad. Days later, we received reports that Iran was sending in members of the Revolutionary Guard to incite the protesters and use the mob to overrun the Baghdad embassy. As luck, both good and bad, would have it, my platoon was on alert that week. A general I'd never seen before came by the ready room to personally tell us we would be flying out the following day to reinforce the embassy. I was terrified. We'd been briefed that a Shia militia group in Baghdad had acquired surface-to-air missiles from Iran in hopes of shooting down an American aircraft. We were flying in on Ospreys, tilt rotor death traps, maneuverable as a semi truck, and armed only with a medium machine gun. Even if we survived the flight, we'd be landing on an American island in a sea of people who wanted us dead. It was one thing to get in a firefight with a group of five or so insurgents, as I'd so often imagined doing. It was another thing entirely to get blown out of the sky or to face down 5,000 angry Iraqis who wanted to cave my skull in with paving stones. I would have liked to just get it over with but in the Marine Corps, nothing happens quickly. Our flight was scheduled for 1500. 
which meant we had to be staged on the flight line at 1200, which meant we had to be processed at the terminal at 10, which meant the trucks were picking us up at 08, which meant we had to report full accountability of all gear and personnel to the battalion by 730, which meant we had to get breakfast at 630, which meant we had to wake up to shave and finish packing at five, which meant I spent the night before a flight staring at the bottom of the bunk above mine, worried I would oversleep if I let myself drift off. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adam. And thank you to all of our readers. Um, as we wrap up this portion of the program, before we move on to our panel, let's give them all one last uh, virtual round of applause. And I will uh, begin introducing our panelists, starting with our moderator. Uh, born in St. Louis, Missouri, Mark Bowden is the author of 15 books, including the number one New York Times bestseller, Black Hawk Down, as well as Hugh 1968 and the Finnish The Killing of Osama bin Laden. Black Hawk Down, a finalist for the National Book Award, was the basis of the film of the same name. His book, Killing Pablo, The Hunt for the World's Greatest Outlaw, won the Overseas Press Club's 2001 Cornelius Ryan Award for the Book of the Year. A reporter and columnist for the Philadelphia Inquirer for more than 30 years, Bowden is, now, or Bowden is now a contributing writer at The Atlantic. Over the years, he has contributed to Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, Men's Journal, Rolling Stone, and Sports Illustrated. Um, our panelists uh, tonight will be Nick Lopez. Nick Lopez is a Marine Corps veteran and the Youth Programs Coordinator at the Veterans of Foreign Wars National Headquarters in Kansas City, Missouri. Nick volunteers with the Kansas City Veterans Writing Team, and his work has been published in Veterans Voices, Haiku Journal, and Line of Advance. His essay, I Am a Coconut, won the Johnson County Public Library Imagine Your Story contest. His visual art has been displayed in several exhibitions and galleries in the Kansas City area. Next, uh, the next panelist is Elaine Little. Elaine Little is a writer and army veteran who deployed to Cuba, Bosnia, and Afghanistan. Most recently, her work was featured in The War Horse Consequence Forum and Proud to Be Volumes 10 and 11. She also contributed as a librettist on a mini musical for New Musicals Incorporated based on her, ex her, <clears throat> based on her experiences as an interrogator in Afghanistan. It was performed at the Los Angeles Fringe Festival. In January 2023, she was selected as a Grindstone Pitchfest Logline finalist for her screenplay Bagram. Next, we have J.B. Stevens. J.B. Stevens lives in the southeastern United States with his wife and daughter. He was a finalist for the Colonel Darren L. Wright Award for Poetry, was nominated for a Pushcart Prize, and was Lit Reactor's featured writer for 2021 National Poetry Month. His fiction won Mystery Tribune's inaugural micro contest. He was also a finalist for the Claymore Award. Before his writing career, J.B. was an Army Infantry Officer. He served in Iraq and earned a bronze star. And next we have Charity Winters. Charity Winters is a graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and Austin Pay's <clears throat> English Literature Program. Her work has appeared in various publications, including the Red Mud Review, Scintilla, The Report, The Free State Review, The Lutheran Digest, Leatherneck, Proceedings, O Dark 30, The Round Table, The Blue Mountain Review, and Proud to Be Writing by American Warriors. Let's have a big round of applause for our moderator and all of our panelists. All right, thank you, Jim. I guess it's my, the ball's in my court. Um, it's been a pleasure reading and listening to these stories and poems. And, you know, the, it's just an amazing variety of uh, voices and and situations, I think some of the things that strike me just in general is that there's almost no writing at all about what the mission of the war is, whatever war it was, nor is there much writing about things like uh, a triumph or uh, accomplishment. Uh, rather, you know, the stories tend to be about things like absurdity or loss or confusion or uh, trauma, boredom, or fear. So I mean, these are just some of my general observations. I thought I'd start off by asking a Charity, um, who has written poems and an essay in this volume, about uh, what your insights are just overall. Uh, 
into the the nature of why people write on this topic um, and why we and why they write why they write the way they do. I mean, why are these stories not what most people would ordinarily think of uh, when um, they think of? When they think of, um, well, I think, well, one, their stories are um, probably authentic. And that first and foremost, uh, war, war is absurd. <laughs> it, is an, it is an experience that, it is a human experience that has been since the beginning. Human beings do this to one another. But um, it is a rather absurd thing to do that we do. But in it, because there are usually, I, I say there's two types of stories. There are war stories and there's stories that happen in war. So then you can have such a spectrum of a story. Um, things funny happen, life happens. If it's a story happening in war, it's going to cover the whole spectrum of it to include the mundane and the everyday, because that's mostly what our life is made up of, to include war. Um, so yes, for them to fall onto the level of experiencing the boredom and to the absurd, that's pretty much how day-to-day -day life is. That's quite authentic to the story and the experience within moments of maybe sheer terror <laughs> that come in. But um, I, I mean, I would think that they are actually in communication with the majority of, of war literature um, in that most war literature is not necessarily a celebration of it as something that is to be achieved or to be glorified, but mostly a story of what we do. And to participate in that is participating in a literary tradition that encompasses most of human history. So, and in that you can find the voices that share all of that. Um, I was thinking in some of these stories, I was actually, when I was hearing them, I was thinking of Chaucer's Knight returning home from his deployment to go on a pilgrimage, to go on a holiday with his nephew and the, the, the state of, they were disheveled characters in Chaucer's story. They were beat up, they were tired. And then the stories that they share are stories that have just moments of absolute absurdity. They don't glorify it, but they tell it as based on their experience. And what's interesting is yes, even this noble knight returning home is dirty, he's rusty and he's tired, um, but he's going on this one big, he's going on a vacation. So I would say that all of these experiences are in conversation with literature that's gone before and it's in conversation with literature that's coming. Thanks, yeah. I mean, it's uh, surprising too, uh, and shouldn't be because of the sheer number of people who get involved in anything like a modern war effort, um, the, the tremendous variety of experiences um, that people choose to write about and very often experiences that really don't relate at all to combat or warfare. And I'm thinking of, of uh, your story, um, it, it's Elaine, right? Um, Elaine, you know, you wrote, tell us a little bit about your story, what you wrote about, which I think I can safely say would not fall into the category of a war story in most people's minds. Oh, thank you. Um, well. Um, I think it kind of is a war story, I guess is, you know, a deployment or run up to a, a, a deployment story. And I, I wanted to explore um, it from um, kind of a woman getting deployed and, and, you know, how that has an effect on the family. And of course, if it was a man getting deployed, um, you, you have a similar um, effect also. But um, I, I just wanted to specifically concentrate on how, you know, children process it and how, um, you know, maybe somebody who possibly, the character was possibly kind of socially awkward, um, communicates it to her family and how this can have ripple effect. You know, it's, it's like, it's not just what she's telling them at the, the, this dinner out. It's, this is gonna be going on for like a possibly 12 to 15 months. And there's all kinds of, you know, changes her kids are gonna go through in those 15 months. And she's probably going to get only get back for one visit at most. And so I, I just wanted to shed a light on what families go through and during uh, deployment. Well, it certainly would be a, almost a universal story, as you say, in that, you know, everybody who gets sent to war who has a family has to have that conversation. 
at some, mm -hmm. some point. And, you know, it can be, if it's in the hands of a good writer, a really poignant, uh, complex situation, which I think is what you captured in, in your story. Uh, JB, on the other hand, writes about combat. Um, and I think there is in your story, is it called Purple Flames, JB? The, um, both the absurdity and the suddenness and confusion and haunting uh, quality of combat. So could you talk about how you tried to capture that in your story? So uh, first of all, the, the reason I was in combat was actually because of you. So uh, I, I went to the, I went to the <laughs> Citadel after I, after I, after I read a book by Pat Conroy. And then uh, in 2000, I read Black Hawk Down and I was like, I, I have to join the infantry. And I did. Um, so yeah, it was, it was, it was very, very interesting when they said you were going to be the, uh, the, the announcer. Um, but, but com combat was like somebody else said, uh, I, I was an in infantry in the infantry in Iraq in, uh, 2007 and 2008. And, uh, it, it's, it's just boring and scary. Um, you, 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 you don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you're out. Somebody else mentioned this literally just in the middle of, of, of Sadr city and, uh, every, everybody either hates you or wants to kill you. Uh, you feel so out of place. It, it's horrible. And, and the absurdity of it is you, you see these things that, that you just, you, you can't imagine. Um, I, I, I remember the first time I saw different colored flames. Uh, I remember the first time I saw propane tanks uh, flying at me. And I was like, why are they throwing propane tanks at us? And they put rockets on them and then they, they land and they blow up. So you, you see these things that you just didn't never, never in a million years, you would see them. Uh, you would think of them. Um, and then, and then one of the, the craziest things I ever saw was I, I was, I was asleep on a, a black Hawk and I, I was sleeping and all of a sudden I woke up and I, I kind of forgot where I was. And I saw the, the tracers going and the tracers coming back and they looked like laser beams. And I remembered a, a laser show from when I was a kid. And I was like, it was, it was so, like you said, absurd, uh, the colors and the sounds, they, they just never leave you. And it's not the, the browns and the grays, it's the, it's the crazy uh, chemical colors that you just never forget. And sometimes they come back to you so vivid. Uh, and then that's where that story came from. I, 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 I saw something on fire and it was, it was this weird iridescent green and I started reading about why it was green. And then I started reading about all the different ways that uh, uh, different colored fire comes. And, and it led to that story, which is a, a, about a guy dying and there's a purple flame. So, yeah. So, I mean, the stories clearly are um, compelling and, and raise questions, emotions, feelings in, in the mind of readers. Um, and I'm always struck by whether a story appears or a poem, let's say, because of an experience or whether it begins with an idea and then you search out the experience to express the idea. Nick, the poem of yours that I've seen, The Scream, is like a snapshot of an instant. And maybe you can explain what the origins of that poem were. Was it an, an instant or was it an idea? Um, really, it started from the first weekend of the Russia-Ukraine war. Um, I was at home watching the news and, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about uh, nuclear war recently and how easily it's discussed uh, in the news. Um, Edvard Munch is one of my favorite painters. Uh, and so his it's a recreation after uh, his painting, The Scream. Uh, and so it was just something I, I researched uh, accounts from the Japanese in Hiroshima, uh, their accounts. And that's kind of where the poem came from. Uh, it came after I painted the, the picture, so. It is interesting that both in that poem and, and painting, and if you read John Hersey's Hiroshima, which was really an inspirational book for me many years ago, um, the explosion of the bomb 
is something that just happens. Uh, there's nothing in Hiroshima. There's no 600 word prologue. There's no first chapter that explains the historical moment or the reasoning behind dropping the atom bomb. It is just a flash happens in the sky. It could as well be a, a meteor, you know, hitting the earth. And so in that sense, then the story becomes kind of universal, uh, that this is happening to ordinary people who, who have no idea uh, why it happened or what just happened to them. And I think that in a way, I mean, you see that in a lot of the stories that I've read in this collection, uh, the individual soldier is often unaware of the larger picture or how or why uh, things are happening to them, even, even in the moment. Do you think that's one of the reasons why writers feel compelled to go back and make sense of their experience? Anybody? Charity? Um, yes, I think that you're you're leading into an idea of where um, it may have been a destructive experience that they may be writing about. Um, but to create, to write, to participate in art is it's creation, it's an act of creation. It's something that's human. It's inherent to being human to be able to create. And so then to be able to take, if let's say it is a destructive experience and create, you are being constructive with that with that narrative, with that information, and you're pulling something out that may have felt as far from being human, even though it was a human act, and you're creating from it and you're making the experience constructive. You may be even imbuing meaning to it, but you're definitely sharing it, you're putting it out there, you're contributing to the human, the human story. And it's ongoing, but yes, it definitely can, make a destructive or a dehumanizing experience and make it constructive and put it into a human narrative. And when you, when you do that, and I'll ask this of you, Elaine, are you doing it for yourself? Or are you doing it for, for the rest of the world to understand? Um, at like when I'm creating something, mm -hmm. um, I would say I'm doing it for both. Um, I'm doing it because I want clarity and I want to understand a situation better, but I also love to share my work and I love to see my work out in the world and other people reading it if possible, because I, I feel that, um, well, especially as a woman, I, I feel like um, sometimes there's not enough um, like literature and, you know, non, I'm talking nonfiction and fiction out in the world that has um, like women veterans talking about um, experiences they've had, either memoir or uh, especially fiction. I haven't seen much fiction at all, but um, not, you know, not as much as, you know, men have written. And so I, I really, you know, sure, I, I sometimes see um, writing as therapeutic. I see it as a way to, to get my mind clear and to see things better whether I'm writing about something that I experienced or something that I'm imagining somebody could experience. And I also hope that when I put it out in the world that maybe it can either help somebody else or entertain them or give them some knowledge they didn't have before. Yeah. Nick, did you want to ask a question there? Uh, no, I didn't have any question answered. <laughs> okay. All right, and, and JB, uh, I'll ask you a similar question. Uh, when you write like Purple Flame, is it you trying to sort out your own feelings about your experience or is it you trying to educate the reader about what your experience was like? I, I, I write uh, crime fiction and, and comedy pieces as well. And, and I always tell people that, that comedy is to entertain me uh, crime is to keep me occupied and the military stuff is just what's inside. It's just getting it out. And like you said, it's helping me uh, sort and understand my, my feelings. It's helping me sort and understand myself. And a lot of it's for my daughter, actually. Um, I, I want her to understand me. And some things are hard to talk about. So if she can read these things, I feel like she will, she will better understand me. And then she can read my ridiculous comedy and laugh, and then I don't feel all awkward about it. Yeah. 
you know, one of the common themes in almost everyone's writing is uh, the haunting nat nature of the experience of, of war. Uh, how, I, and I think it's, this is mentioned in the introduction to the collection, how it's never really over uh, your experience in war. Um, can you talk about that, Nick, for a minute? What, what uh, about the experience is just searing and unforgettable? I think it really just depends on each person. Um, you know, as uh, Adam talked in his piece, there was a lot of waiting and uh, going into combat. If he wasn't in, go to combat, it wasn't he wouldn't be a good enough Marine. Um, or there's some Marines that are in firefights uh, quite often while they're deployed. Um, you know, for me, the haunting experience that you know stuck with me is seeing the destruction and the aftermath of what war is. Um, seeing children on the side of the road begging for water uh, and you know you're not allowed to throw them a water bottle um, that sticks with you um, and uh, JB brought up his daughter I have a son and I, I think about that now as a father I didn't really think about that as a 21 year old um, in Iraq you know trained and trained and you know told who the enemy is and when you're there, everyone's the enemy if you don't know them. Um, and so, and that sticks with you for, for a long time. And afterwards you process that um, and try to let go of that fear. And through my art and writing, it helps me, um, you know, process that. I think that, you know, uh, Charity writes about the um, logistics really of, you know, supplying units as they go out into uh on patrols or whatever and then coming back um was that the, the kind of job that that you did when you were in the military charity um i was actually a security forces officer i was the air force version of military police officer when i was on active duty and so um, we did have this very cyclic deployment cycle um, but as a security forces officer, I participated. My first deployment was running gun trucks for army line haul units, convoy supply units going up and down the country. So I did participate in logistics tangentially and that we provided security for on the ground logistics. Um, but in that constant turnover repeat process, I mean, I had, I experienced a return. I left Iraq, my first deployment in February of 2006, and I was back in Iraq by November of 2006. I was back in some of the same places I had just seen, and then I did it again in another year. And so I literally just seemed to have this sense of seeing places more familiar, has more familiar with in Iraq than where I was living with this almost revolving door like view of repetition. And then that brings up the question of, I think you mentioned nobody had really even talked about the mission in their writing. Um, when things are protracted, when we have protracted conflicts like the ones that we've been most recently involved in, um, mission creep is inherent and does, I think things get blurry and um, it becomes a cyclic experience with the question of to what end. So, but I was a military police officer. I see. So, I mean, this collection is a collection of stories about and related to war. Are you all writing about other things as well? Is this just a small slice of, of the kind of work that you do? I'll ask you, JB, first. I, I am. Um, like I said, the, the war stuff, it, it takes a lot out of me emotionally. But uh, my, my other stuff is, is very fun. Um, I write, I write a lot of comedy. Uh, I, I, my, my favorite comedy piece I wrote recently um, is about a, a Mormon missionary who moves to Miami with the intention of taking over the drug trade. And it's, it's inter, interspaced with quotes from the Book of Mormon and uh, Chief Keefe, a rapper. Uh, then I, 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 I write a lot of poetry. Um, I've, I've had a lot of comedy poetry published. And then, then my main focus is, is crime fiction. Uh, I, I really like crime fiction. Um, the, the, especially if you get into the older noir stuff, it's, there's a lot of uh, tangential association with the wars, but they don't actually bring it up. But, but 
you know, er everything written in the 50s, everybody was a veteran and, and most of them had seen heavy combat. So all those all those old Raina Chandler things and 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 Marla, they're all they're all war stories, but you know, they're not they're set in Philadelphia or LA. So uh, I think I think reading and writing noir is my by far my my favorite um, genre, both to consume and produce. How about you, Elaine? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, me and uh, Mr. Stevens have something in common because I also write a lot of dark comedy um, as well scripts, and I just uh, finished a TV pilot about two girls escaping from a polygamy cult and going on the road to like find their own. <laughs> <laughs> a better way of life let's put it that way and uh so i i really um my tastes run to that and i've written a lot of non-military stuff um i i seem to have um some women's issues crop up in my stories a lot of times um i'm trying not to be you know somebody i'm hitting somebody you know people over the head with a message but i you know a lot of stuff i'm i'm drawn to politics i'm drawn to policy and and the way that religion affects our lives so those kind of things come into my um fiction a lot um so but um often in a very darkly comedic way because i think that you can you can get a lot of messages across that nobody would listen to you like in a conversation with them if you were talking about it, but somehow if you could put it into a, a fictional piece and make it funny, sometimes sometimes the ideas will penetrate and, and people will be more willing to engage with it um, somehow. And I've seen it happen. So it's, it's kind of weird. So I, I feel like I'm on the right track with this. <laughs> and you, Nick? Uh, yes, yeah, so obviously I'm an artist and a writer, so uh, I mainly paint. Um, I also, my essay, I'm a coconut, um, that was based off of my experience growing up as a Hispanic in a small town in Missouri and uh, being one of very few Hispanics in the town. Um, my experience with racism, uh, I wrote it after a uh, right after the George, George Floyd protests. Um, uh, other than that, uh, right now I'm working on a, a script with uh, one of the members of our writing team in here in Kansas City. All right, thanks. I, I think we're supposed to move at this point to, uh, you were gonna ask me questions, so fire away if you've got any. Yeah. Well, thank you first, Mark, for uh, joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, the first question I have for you is, uh, you are easily known and praised for your ability to write military nonfiction. Considering how well you write on the topic, having the ability to recreate the battle minute by minute and capture the brutality of the fight and the heroism of those who fought and died there, it might be surprising to folks that you do not have direct military service experience. How did you go about writing on the topic and what were your approaches? Well, it's true. I'm a, I'm a reporter. Uh, you know, I started working as a journalist uh, the day I graduated from college. And, and frankly, you know, if I had taken time off to join the military and spent years away from my craft, maybe I wouldn't be as good at doing it. But, you know, for me, whether I'm writing about war and war is one of many, many different things that I've written about over the years, the approach is the same. You know, I try to understand the people that I'm writing about, the situation that I'm writing about. And the method is just to get to people who know what they're talking about and listen to them and ask them enough questions that I can get to the point where I feel like I understand, you know, where they're coming from why they think the way they do, why they did the things they did, whether it's writing about crime or war or sports, uh, it's the same process, basically. So, you know, for people to assume that I've been in the military on the basis of my reporting on that subject is tremendously flattering because maybe it doesn't sound like I'm a complete outsider. And if I don't, it's just because I'm channeling all those voices, all those ideas, all those experiences that I've collected. All right, next one is Hugh 1968 has tendencies to go back and forth between fact based journalism and storytelling. Could you talk about finding this mix between the two? 
<laughs> we'll get to you in a second, JB. Um, that the, first of all, I should say that the, it's, it's Hue, Hue 1968. You can tell how old a person is. If you're as old as I am, you remember Vietnam and you know that Hue was the, the old capital of Vietnam and the scene of that tremendous battle. Um, I take a little umbrage, uh, and I shouldn't, but I'm just joking, that, you know, that there's some difference between nonfiction and storytelling. I am a nonfiction storyteller. Uh, and so when I'm writing a story, it, where I, you know, instead of just basically reporting on the factual record on based on documents and, and what have you, you know, I go out and I interview some cases, hundreds of people. So when you read my stories, it's me telling their stories. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. I'm better than most people are at, at organizing a large mass of information and pulling it together into a coherent narrative. Uh, so if it feels like I'm straying from the facts and you're being swept up in a story, well, that's just great. But I insist that what I'm writing is to the best of my knowledge, what happened. I think JB had his hand up uh, a minute ago and then we'll get to you, Charity. I'm just curious, what, what, are, what are some of your favorite books that you've read recently? You know, I, I have been uh, reading a whole heck of a lot of, of 18th century novels. So I've been sort of working my way through Dickens and uh, Anthony Trollope. You know, I think that uh, uh, Bleak House is just amazing. Uh, Tom Jones is one of the most hilarious things I've ever read. If you've never read it, JB, and you're a comedy writer, I, I recommend that you pick up Tom Jones, uh, one of the greatest, most hilarious books ever written. Um, so that, you know, that's where I am for the most part. I, I've been reading Claire Keegan's uh, books. Um, gosh, the names are going to escape me right now. They're short novellas uh, that are just wonderful. Um, and I just finished reading this massive biography of Fyodor Dostoevsky, which I don't recommend unless, uh, you know, you're deeply into the subject matter. But uh, I'm about now to uh, plunge into his novels, some of which I'll be reading for the first time and some of which I'll be rereading, maybe with a better understanding of who he was and what he was trying to do. Charity, you had a question? Yes, it's it's in the vein of the question. It's not. It's a question, a statement, or should I say, an encouragement for for you and and some of the work and how it's affected things, even down to a personal level, uh, even to go back to when I was running guns. And it's it's a vignette to try to explain to you even the power of writing. And someone had asked, how do we know what a true war story is or isn't, and who can write it? But that writing the story, the nonfiction story, is, is writing that book is important and it's important that we, we read because somewhere in our collective memory, someone might say, oh yeah, I've read that book. I know how the story ends, even if it isn't the story in front of them, but we've read the book, we've read the novel, we've read Dickens, and we've read Black Hawk Down and how that information informs our, 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 our own words and communication with one another. But back when I was running gun trucks, the way we had to pack the gun trucks, even for like a 15 minute um, patrol, even in the middle of the day, was you had to pack as if you were never coming home to include all nighttime equipment in case you were never coming home. Night vision right. goggles, night vision yeah. goggles over and over and over again. That comment, did anyone pack the night vision goggles? And I remember a sergeant going, Black Hawk down. <laughs> <laughs> Remember reading? No, it's the stories that matter, and we carry stories. And your story mattered. It still matters. It still informs. But it informs even at such a level as that we are readers and we're storytellers and we remember stories. Right. And we remember how that story ends. And so I just wanted to, to put that out there as to even why we're participating in writing stories. And in that, you're reading Dickens now. His stories still matter. He's still informing the conversation, the communication, but mostly I wanted you to know that we carried night vision goggles. <laughs> so thank you so you're, much. You're, for you're that. very welcome. I hope, <laughs> I hope that that's helped a lot of people. Go ahead, JB. I'm reading a question from somebody named Joshua Boley here in the QA section. Uh, and he said, as everyone is a writer, I'm curious what, you, what each read in their free time or if they have a favorite author. So uh, I guess. Uh, 
Mark, you already told us what you're in your free time. Um, I know it's a very pointed question. Do you have a favorite author? And this is coming from Josh, not me. I don't mean, I'm not putting you on the spot. Joshua Boley is. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the honest answer to that question is no, uh, I don't. Uh, you know, I'm 71 years old. I've been reading for 60 or more years. I, I'm so glad that I'm an avid reader because it just fills my days with such such fascinating stuff. And, you know, I often say that uh, I'm incapable of being truly bored as long as I have a book. So I have many, many, you know, favorite writers, many, many favorite books, and it would just be, it's very unhelpful for me to say that I can't knit single one out. But I will say, you know, keep reading and find writers that you love. All right, I am going to jump in here. Um, we've got a few questions from our audience. Thank you, JB, for I was just going to let you roll with it if that's where you were going. Um, <laughs> let's see here. Um, this one was asked uh, early on by Anne, who's also a contributor uh, to all panelists and Mark. Do you have any reservations about writing, especially nonfiction, memoir, true stories in relation to what sort of reaction your military peers might have, especially if they're included in your work? Well, in my case, uh, you know, people know that I'm going to be writing about them because I've gone and interviewed them and asked them a lot of questions. I think I'm more concerned and was particularly with a book like Black Hawk Down with what the impact of certain information would have on their families, uh, on their loved ones, particularly writing about the death of a soldier. And in that case, I actually contacted all of the families and, and talked to them and told them what was coming in the book and gave them the uh, right to say, no, they did not want me to explain exactly what happened. And in every instance they did, uh, which I actually was so, sort of surprised uh, that they felt that way. Um, but, you know, so, I mean, that's the best I can answer that question. For sure. Anybody else want to answer that? I've got one last question after this. Okay, we'll go on to this next one um, from David. How do you think the way war has been written and recorded has influenced the experience of it? For example, how did the historical and literary interpretations of Vietnam influence the way participants or Iraq perceive the experience? I would say hugely. You know, I think popular culture really does shape our understanding, uh, not just of war itself, but on, of particular conflicts. Um, you know, I, when I wrote Way 1968 about the Battle of Hue in Vietnam, it really runs counter to almost 20 or 30 years or more of fiction and nonfiction writing about Vietnam, which has been so roundly you know, lambasted as a huge national mistake to the extent where, if you think about the great films about Vietnam, soldiers were portrayed either as crazy people, sadists or victims. Uh, who were crippled for life, you know, by their experience. And I think, you know, those characterizations um, have had a huge impact on people's perception of the military, on their perception of war. And I think you could contrast that with uh, the kind of uh, pop culture treatment of World War II, uh, where war was seen as a very noble enterprise and soldiers were heroic uh, for what they did. And I think, you know, Young people who enter the military um, are casting themselves in roles in a way that, that they've seen portrayed either on film or, or in books. I mean, JB mentioned he, he read Black Hawk Down and that you know, inspired him to go to war. And, and it's interesting to me that you know, if you would ask me to dis distill the message of Black Hawk Down to one sentence, it would be that this is a story about a group of young men who desperately want to experience combat and who get their wish. JV? I wanted to respond to Mark. What I, what I took from the work uh, was the, the camaraderie and, and that's what I wanted. It, it, I, I wanted what they had, the, 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 the togetherness. And, and I did get that. So I, I got what I wanted. Um, so I, I very much appreciate it. 
And then I, sure. I also wanted to say we were talking about um, recording and, and something that happened uh, during my time in the war is the, the iPhones came out. So I left before iPhones and I came back after iPhones. And that is, that's amazing. The, the, the amount of, of access and, and uh, uh, recording that happens now. I have so many memories that are fuzzy and people that went to war a year after me, they have like everything on video and on camera and it's, it's, it's just crazy to me. So I just want to throw those two things out there. And the, the whole Ukraine thing now, I mean, they're, they're live streaming combat. It's the craziest, craziest thing. Uh, just the change that happened in late 2007, early 2008. And I, and I would add, JB, that that isn't just war. I've been an, a reporter for 50 years and, you know, 50 years ago, when I started, if there was a single still photograph of something that I was writing about, it was extremely useful to me because I could get, gather all kinds of information. Today, it's actually rare when I write a story that there isn't actually video of the thing that I'm writing about, or there isn't actually recordings of all the audio of all, if you read Black Hawk Down, all that radio traffic in the middle of that battle, that was all recorded. All, everything you read there is what was actually said. That is a real feature of uh, modern times, and, and it will become, I think, an increasingly large challenge for storytellers who have to learn to extract from such enormous quantities of information just what you need to tell an important story. Perfect. We are going to end it at that. Thank you, James, for all the great introductions to our readers and panelists for taking our virtual stage tonight and to Missouri State Lieutenant Governor for his supportive words. With special thanks to Mark for moderating tonight's discussion and for once again supporting Proud to Be. Uh, thanks to all of you that attended in support of our veteran writers, including our board chair Petra's out there. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks everybody for being a part of the conversation. Uh, just a reminder to please take a few minutes to fill out the survey, uh, which will pop up on your screen at the end of the webinar. Uh, we would love to hear your thoughts on tonight's event. Uh, we encourage you to stay in touch with us by following us on social media at Mo Humanities. Become a member or join our email list on our website, mohumanities.org. We sincerely hope you enjoyed this evening and that maybe you feel inspired to pick up your very own copy of Proud to Be. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful night. And uh, we'll see you hopefully this time next year for our next reading of PTB 12. Good night, everyone. Thank you.